the magnificent city of Palmyra was a jewel of the East. Rising from the deserts of Syria, to welcome travelers with a scene of unrivaled splendor. As a center of trade on the Roman Empire's eastern frontiers, by the middle of the 3rd century CE, Palmyra had flourished into a capital as wealthy and powerful as it was beautiful. Even the emperors of Rome had paid homage to the city and sought to ally themselves with its illustrious rulers. Flanked by high hills to the east, Palmyra filled the entire plain below, as far as the eye could reach both north and south. Tall palm trees swayed among its temples and palaces of glistening marble, as grand monuments adorned the groves and public gardens that surrounded the city for miles in every direction. In the center, the vast temple of the god Bel stretched its myriad marble columns up toward the heavens, surrounded by obelisks, domes, arches, and towers that combined traditions from Syria, Egypt, Greece, and well beyond in this vibrant crossroads of cultures. Along the roads leading to the city, elephants and camels strode laden with merchandise from across the known world. Not far from the temple was a public area called the Great Colonnade, a place devoted to leisure and to commerce, where the bustling multitudes passed through every day, a diverse population of native Palmyrenes, Persians, Parthians, Arabians, Egyptians, Jews, Greeks, and Romans. Palmyra had grown exceptionally wealthy and strong over the decades, but it wouldn't reach the peak of its glory, rising even to become the head of an empire, until the reign of its greatest monarch, the Queen Zenobia. And the story of this queen and conqueror is no less dazzling than the city she ruled. The culture of Palmyra was a unique blend of its people's ethnic roots in Arabia and Mesopotamia, and the literature, art, and architecture of the Greeks and Romans that had spread across the Mediterranean world. Zenobia herself claimed descent from the Macedonian kings and queens who once ruled Egypt, the long dynasty of the Ptolemies who succeeded Alexander the Great. She was every bit the equal of her famous ancestor Cleopatra in her intelligence and ambition. Well studied in Latin, Greek, Syriac, and the languages of Egypt, she was a thoroughly educated woman. Her teacher was the celebrated scholar Longinus, under whose instruction the likes of Homer and Plato had become as familiar as old friends to her, and she wrote literary Greek with ease and elegance. She assembled a history of the Eastern lands for her own use and enjoyment, and took pleasure in exploring the arts and sciences, when her duties allowed time away from the stern pursuits of war and diplomacy. Zenobia married Odonathus, a courageous prince who ruled over the desert tribes, and rose as Palmyra's king and the commander of its armies, to make himself master of the East. So powerful did Odonathus' kingdom become that the Roman Empire sought his alliance and invested him with the duties of protecting the empire's eastern frontiers against the enemies beyond. Rome bestowed upon him the revered title of Corrector Totius Orientis, the man who would stabilize and secure all the lands of the east. As an ally and agent of the empire, he won victories over the great king Shapur, sovereign of the restored Persian Empire, and twice pursued his armies even to the gates of their imperial capital. But at the height of his glory, Odonathus' victories were cut short, when a hidden assassin struck during a royal hunt and murdered both the king and his eldest son. The king of the east was dead. His queen Zenobia, no less a warrior than her slain husband, turned her grief into action, and avenged his death by hunting his killer down. Left alone to rule the impressive city and its armies, she first took supreme power in the name of her three young sons, but finally declared herself sole ruler of Odonathus's dominions. Zenobia proved more than a match for the pressures of leadership, and put to good use the lessons in the art of rule that she had learned at her husband's side. She assumed the royal diadem as her crown, 
and inherited, on her own wishes, the grand titles as an ally of Rome, of commander and protector of the East. With the kingdom in her own hands, she governed her realm judiciously, capable of executive decision as well as weighing advice, of harsh punishment as well as mercy, of restraint as well as grandeur. Palmyra flourished all the more under her rule as she spent immense sums for the adornment of the city and gathered around her philosophers, poets, artists, and others of great renown from across the lands. The queen was adored by her subjects and feared admiringly by rival sovereigns. Arabia, Armenia, and Persia sought alliances with her, and she soon added Egypt to the domains won by Odonathus. By now her dominions extended from the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean, and included Jerusalem, Antioch, Damascus, and other famed cities. But Zenobia still made the beautiful Palmyra her home, where she raised her three sons, Timolaus, Herennianus, and Vabalathus, as princes of the realm, and abided by the duties her family had assumed as friends of the Roman imperial court. The clothes they wore were the regal Roman purple of the Caesars, and they adopted the ways of Rome. But far west, in the heartland of that empire, a threat to Zenobia's kingdom was brewing. The current emperor of Rome, named Gallienus, refused to acknowledge her claim to the sovereignty and powers of her late husband. In the eyes of the Roman state, her titles were illegitimate, since they hadn't been formally bestowed upon her as they once had upon Odonathus. Seeing the Palmyrene kingdom as a rogue state, Gallienus escalated the dispute into a military conflict, and twice tried to bring Palmyra to heel but both imperial armies failed to outmatch the undaunted queen. As the years rolled on, Gallienus met his end, and his successor, the fierce, capable Aurelian, became emperor of Rome. The empire he assumed in the year 270 CE was violent and fractured, having suffered more than three decades of a major crisis that spanned the middle of the empire's third century. Aurelian set about restoring the integrity and safety of the Roman world, leading army after army in the field to establish his government's full control over the empire's lands. Once he had subdued his enemies in the west, he turned his sword against the east and marched against this powerful queen of Syria, who now dared to title herself Augusta, an empress, to seize Roman territories for her own and to clothe her sons in the royal purple. In the capital of Palmyra, rumors began to announce a great army was coming, and Zenobia prepared to meet it. Neither legions nor emperors made her heart grow faint. Soon, the first herald reached Palmyra to announce the arrival of Rome's ambassadors, who had been sent by Aurelian to demand her submission. He was told in reply that Zenobia was at her villa just outside the city, pursuing boars, tigers, and panthers in the hunt through the thick forests to the north. As the messenger of Aurelian reached the villa's gates, the queen had just returned, mounted upon a white Arabian steed with a jeweled harness, and carrying her long spear in her right hand. When the messenger had been announced, she commanded from atop her horse, Tell the servants of your emperor they may meet with us, and we will hear them. Then she rode on to a meeting place of her choosing. With a fanfare of horns and followed by their attendants, the ambassadors sent by Aurelian went to the place where Zenobia calmly awaited them, surrounded by her courtiers. You may state your business with my kingdom, said the queen, and do it plainly. Her expression, clothing, and posture upon her seat bespoke dignity and authority, and her direct gaze conveyed to the onlookers that she would yield no ground. The chief ambassador stepped forward. For centuries past, the Roman replied, the wealth of Egypt and the East flowed into the coffers of Rome. 
Now that wealth goes to Palmyra. Egypt, Syria, Bithynia, and Mesopotamia were dependents of our empire as Roman provinces. And the Queen of Palmyra was once just the Queen of Palmyra. But now she has made herself Queen of Egypt and the East, and she and her sons style themselves as Caesars. By whatever consent of former emperors these honors have been allowed, we tell you now that Aurelian will not tolerate them. While he respects the majesty of Queen Zenobia, he wills on his own honor and the glory of Rome that the empire should be restored again to the borders it reached in ages past. You have spoken well, and indeed plainly, as it befits a Roman, answered Zenobia with a calm voice and steady gaze. Then her eyes flashed with pride as she drew up her stately form and continued. Now hear my words, and as you hear, report each one to the master who sent you. Tell Aurelian that what I am, I have made myself. That this empire of the east that hails me as its queen has been won by Odonathus and Zenobia alone. It is no gift bestowed on me, but a legacy, a possession, a right of conquest. Not by your favor do we Palmyrenes wield it, but by our right of birth and power. And when your emperor starts giving away the provinces he claims as his when someone else demands them, that's when I will give away the lands I have won. Tell Aurelian that, just as I have lived a queen, so by the gods will I die one. The last moment of my reign and my life shall be one and the same. If he is ambitious, let him be aware that I am too. Ambitious for wider empire, for an everlasting fame, for my people's love. And tell him, I do not ask for gratitude from Rome. But history will remember this, that the power that stood between Rome and Persia and saved the empire's eastern frontier, that avenged the death of the disgraced Emperor Valerian at Persian hands, and twice drove the Persian King of Kings to the gates of his own capital. That noble kingdom deserved more from an ally than the insult you bring me now. Gracefully, but with few pleasantries, the ambassadors were dismissed, and Zenobia prepared to defend her kingdom. She wouldn't stand passively by to let the Roman legions come near Palmyra's gates, but instead rallied her forces and marched out to meet them. The empires of Rome and Palmyra clashed in two great battles, both fought with Zenobia at the head of her troops. But in both these battles, the Palmyrenes were overcome by Aurelian's army. Defeated, the queen was forced to fall back within her capital city. Here she made a brave and last defense, and when the Romans assaulted Palmyra in the thousands, again she boldly defied the empire's will. So impressive was her courage, and so well organized were her defenses, that she won not just the fear, but even the respect of the Roman emperor. Aurelian had learned not to underestimate Zenobia's grit, and despite his advantage, he found himself doubting that his siege of Palmyra would end in the total victory he needed. Instead of grinding the city down in a costly campaign, he decided to offer terms of surrender, generous ones at that. But the queen answered the terms in a letter composed in elegant Greek, rejecting the terms defiantly. She knew, as much as Aurelian did, that her domains and allies in the region would provide reinforcements, and even trap Aurelian's encamped army in a siege of its own from the rear. The emperor received her proud letter with frustration, and raised his patrol of the surrounding countryside with more aggressive tactics. He cut off all the lines of provision to her city, attacked several detachments of her allies as they advanced, and found means to sustain his army even in the harsh desert. At last, the people of Palmyra began to feel the pain of hunger 
and hopelessness. The city could hold out no longer. Zenobia determined to rally more support for her beloved city and the surrounding lands, and to do so fled swiftly, desperately, from Palmyra, traveling east with a small team. She made it all the way to the banks of the Euphrates River, but there she was chased by agents of the Romans, and unable to outrun them, was taken captive. Drawn back to the west, where the great imperial army was camped, soon she was brought into the presence of the Roman emperor himself. Aurelian strode into his tent and met eyes with the captive queen. He exuded confidence and victory, but his face was marked by weariness from the long war, and he was careful to show no weakness to an enemy he had learned to take quite seriously. The emperor demanded why she had dared to defy his authority and that of the Roman Empire, and whether she would continue resisting. And Zenobia, still every bit a queen, but also clear-sighted in her judgment, replied unwaveringly, I defended my people and my honor because I refused to make my masters such men as Gallienus. But now, in your presence, to Aurelian the Emperor, as my conqueror and sovereign, I surrender my rule. While this meeting was being held in the commander's tent, a riotous band of Roman soldiers rushed around the tent in an angry mass, demanding her immediate death. But Aurelian, in the end, would accept the surrender of Zenobia, and he spared her life. Yet the resistance of Palmyra had to be punished, and though the queen herself was saved, her teacher and advisor, the philosopher Longinus, and other leaders of the court were put to death by Aurelian. As for the proud and dangerous Zenobia herself, the enemy of Rome, the emperor would showcase this captive when he returned home, as a prize of victory and his army's grand triumphal march. But the suffering of Zenobia's beloved city wasn't finished yet. Once Palmyra was taken, Aurelian seized his wealth of treasures and left a Roman garrison there to keep order. Rich with the plunder of conquest, he started to return to Europe with Zenobia and her family in tow. But when he had reached the Straits of the Hellespont that link east with west, news arrived from Syria that the people of Palmyra had risen up in revolt. At this, Roman vengeance was swift and merciless. Aurelian immediately turned back, and when his army returned to Palmyra's gates, he laid waste to the beautiful city, sparing neither women nor men, neither old nor young, in his bloody work of total devastation. By the time the army withdrew and resumed its journey back to Rome, the once wondrous buildings of Palmyra were smoking heaps of rubble. Upon Aurelian's return to Rome, his triumph was celebrated in the streets with extraordinary splendor and majesty. Vast numbers of elephants, tigers, and other exotic beasts from the conquered nations presented a novel sight to the cheering Roman crowds who watched them pass by, and they marveled at the 1,600 gladiators who followed after. Then there appeared the treasures and insignia of the defeated lands, including the shining medals, jewels, and royal robes of Palmyra's queen. Ambassadors from Ethiopia, Arabia, Persia, Bactria, India, and beyond, finely attired in their striking costumes, showed the extent of Roman power over the whole globe. After these dignitaries, came the long lines of captives, Goths, Vandals, Sarmatians, Alemanni, Franks, Gauls, Syrians, and Egyptians. But among all these, every Roman eye was riveted upon the famous Zenobia, the fabled Queen of the East. Arrayed in her robes and covered with blazing jewels, she walked on foot while her own magnificent chariot was drawn by others behind her, a sobering emblem of her defeat and fall from glory. 
Her arms were bound with shackles of gold. But though her form was bent under the weight of her captivity, her proud eyes were undimmed by tears, and she carried her queenly head with imperial grace. Zenobia's fate after this triumph remains a mystery. Some say she took her own life by slow starvation, refusing to outlive her own downfall and the ruin of her city. Others say that she was summarily executed once her purpose of appearing in the Emperor's triumph had been served. But according to still others, Aurelian bestowed upon her a villa in the countryside northeast of Rome, where she was allowed to reside in great honor, while her daughters married into noble Roman families, and her youngest son became a king in Armenia. Whatever Zenobia's fate truly was, the slow death of her city had been ensured by Aurelian's devastation. In the years after Palmyra had been sacked and burned, its once bustling streets became more and more desolate, as its huge buildings continued to crumble away. Though afterwards the emperor and his successors had tried to revive the site and rebuild a few of its magnificent monuments, it was too late to take back what was done. For all its past glories as a gleaming jewel of the East and the capital of Zenobia's empire, ages to come would find only a village huddled around Palmyra's grand ruins, windswept and half-forgotten in the desert of Syria. <laughs> <laughs>